Every architectural practice needs to define their niche. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Gordon Evans, the director and founder of Youp Architects and the founder of Youp Knows. So Gordon is an architect who has been running his own practice for over 13 years. They specialize in planning, design and delivery information, primarily for residential home owners. And he is also the founder of Youp Knows, which is an architect's dashboard. It's a cloud-based software solution for small, medium-sized architectural practices, which helps architects run and manage their projects efficiently and effectively. So it's a project management tool for not just architects, but architectural designers, technologists, and it's designed to help you keep all the information you need in one place. That way you and your employees and your clients can find exactly what you need when you need it. So in this episode, Gordon discusses not just Youp Knows, but also a powerful digital stack outlining crucial pieces of software that every SME architecture practice should have to run efficiently and effectively. We discuss automations in proposal writing to software for internal communications to BIM to cloud accounting, CRM. Gordon gives us a full 360 of what is needed in your business. So, this one is jam-packed with golden nuggets. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Gordon Evans. One of the most difficult parts about running your architecture practice is making sure you're getting the right fee for the job. We hear small architecture firm owners ask all the time, how do I know what my competitors are charging? How do I know if I'm charging the right fees? Guesstimating fees can be very risky. If you undercharge, you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left to do. Then you find yourself either robbing Peter to pay Paul or stealing from a more profitable project to support a less profitable project. On the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients more than you actually need in order to get the project done. The industry has been lacking this resource for too long. We constantly hear firm owners talk about how great it would be to have some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. Is my pricing right? How do I know if it's right? They go to Google, but end up with outdated or inaccurate information, or what they find doesn't quite seem to fit the flow of their firm's specific approach or demographics. So we've decided to fix this problem ourselves and create this long overdue resource for you. Ever since we founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been one of the most common questions we get. So we are really excited about this. By December of this year, we will be launching the first stage of a comprehensive architecture fee report that will reveal what architecture practices around the world are actually charging and how they set their fees. You'll get to see if others are charging a percentage of construction cost, a stipulated sum, or an hourly rate, along with the associated amounts based on the type of project, their geographical location, and other demographics. Now, One of the advantages of us taking this on as a consulting agency is we can actually put out this kind of information. A couple of decades ago, some may remember that the AIA got into big trouble because they published something similar. The United States Justice Department decided that this was considered price fixing, causing a monopoly, and they shut it down. But since Business of Architecture is not a membership organization and not representing architecture as a whole, we are not limited in discussing fees. Because it is our mission to help architectural practices succeed, we are very excited about gathering and providing this information to all of you in the industry. Keep an eye out in your inbox for more details coming soon. If you're not already on our email list, head over to thebusinessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our free live video training, and watch for your inbox for more details from there. Those on our mailing list will be the first to get notified when we release the architecture fee report. So if you're a small architecture practice owner, you are finally going to get to see very clearly what other similar sized firms with similar demographics and similar project types are actually charging and how they are setting their fees. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. 
www.thinkandgrowthpodcast.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Gordon, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very, very well. Excited to be here. Excited to talk about interesting stuff. Excellent. No, well, I've been seeing your adverts pop up all over my Instagram and follow me around. And I was very uh, excited to be able to have the opportunity to, to speak with you. Mm-hmm. So you're an architect, uh, an entrepreneur. Um, you've developed this very fascinating platform, Youp, which is looking to really disrupt and help a lot of architects with some of the running of their businesses. Um, you've had your own your own business um, you've worked as, as an architect for, from, for a number of decades. Too so, <laughs> so, so I, I guess the first question to, to just kind of start us off was how, how did Youp begin or what is Youp and how did it start? Well, we, we, we have, um, Youp Architects. That's where we start back in 2008 at the height of a recession. Yep. So, uh, we had a plan like everyone does and then the recession literally came and then we went, let's just do it anyway. So we got Youp Architects, and then um, uh, I suppose about three, four years ago, we started uh, Youp Knows, which is, uh, I don't know, it, 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 it spawned out of a need. And that is, I describe it to people how to get your, your architectural practice moving, mm-hmm. rather than sort of saying practice management, project management, all these kind of like loaded words, which sort of seem to come from the 1950s. Mm-hmm. What we're trying to do is just say, well, let's forget about all those kind of things. Let's let's just create a tool that gets people shifting. So it gets rid of the stuff that you don't need or, or you sometimes people think they need. And it just has hopefully the stuff that uh, SME architects uh, need to kind of get their architectural practice going in the direction they want to. And um, most practices are SME architectural yeah. practices, you know, 80% of the architectural industry. And I, and I would say, I would, I would, w- when I say architects, I'm going to rightly or wrongly lump in the um, architectural technologists, anyone doing the uh, function of architecture. Right. Architects. So, you know, 80% of the market is 10 or fewer staff. Mm-hmm. So and, it's, and, it's basically and, everyone. And, and so, so you, did you know then, grow as a a kind of information source or a blog or or a q and a service or what what was it exactly so um the sort of jumping back to youp architects i started right. like every other kind of practice and we're 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 kind of technicians we you know we're good at doing technical stuff and we don't come in from it from a business point of view um, whereas, you know, you take the Elon Musks and such, and they do it the other way around. They, they're business people and then they, they employ technology and expertise and they get the right people to solve a problem. But because we're architects or, you know, the function of architecture, we, we just want to do architecting. And, mm-hmm. um, that's why, you know, people talk endlessly why you have a podcast and why you have a business <laughs> of, um, uh, mentoring architects how to run their practice because it's it's not something that we engage with throughout our career or in our education. So mm. from 2008, I was a very organised architect. You know, I was when when I was in in practice, like everyone else, worked with someone else. I was always the instigator and um, necessary irritant in the practice, trying to like. Let's find the best tools. Let's let's try and disrupt. Let's do think. Maybe I'm inherently lazy, and I'm always looking for a better a better tool to do something. And so I remember importing SketchUp version one from America. That the um, I won't name the practice. Right, the general manager thought that was a terrible idea, so I paid for it myself. And it, was it will amazing. never catch on. <laughs> it won't catch on. There's no future in that. Um, uh, so, uh, th- those kind of things. And then even I-, I was quite geeky. So I think I had a computer since I was about 11 or 12 and I'm not that young. So I, I told my parents, oh, I want to buy a computer. And they said, what's that? <laughs> you know, cause I saw an advert. And, um, so I've always had a computer 
and always been interested in programming such. So even even when I was at that same practice, uh, mm-hmm. they said sketch up, no good. Um, we had a plotter, and this was going. This is probably going back oof, fifteen more years, maybe twenty years. And big the big plotters in the practice, and. I used to get on really well with the the guy who used to look after the servers and such because we spoke the same language. And they were going to buy another plotter because there was too many, there was about 50 people in the practice all trying to use the same plotter. And um, and plotters back then were probably, you didn't get much change out of like probably like five, seven grand, maybe more. Yeah. So I looked at it and I went, actually, you don't need another plotter. It's It's because every time we send something to print, it's it's taking the maximum time to print because you've got a board around it. So it goes boom, 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 boom. So what I did is I didn't ask anyone. This is my way. Never ask. Always 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 seek forgiveness. Never ask permission. And because most of them don't understand what you're doing anyway. Oh, uh, I just <laughs> you just brought back memories of, of standing in front of the plotter with like you've got a small little section on it and an A1 yeah. piece of paper. Just yeah, watching the board being boom, printed out. Boom. Boom, it would take the maximum time. So I was like, you, you don't need another potter. I'm going to save the practice seven grand here. And um, so I talked to the uh, the guy who looked after um, the setup. And he had – it was a good setup, and he had all the um, the title blocks that were come from the server. So we could do it globally. And what we did is we just went in and we we got rid of that box – so simple most people wouldn't notice and we got rid of that box and then all of a sudden you print something like that big and it the the, the printer then just went done and all of a sudden everyone could print you know 50 people could use one plotter and i was like thank you very much <laughs> yeah it, it, and so you know that, that i think that it's worth sharing that in that innovation for sure <laughs> oh yeah it was so simple and you know but I'm sure there's, you know, the 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 the, tw- the early twenties now are doing the same thing. I wouldn't understand, but yeah. I, I would, I would have more trust and say, look, you do it, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll fix it. Because mm-hmm. um, th- this is this is the, I suppose, the overall message. What we're talking about today is practices need to adopt um, innovation um, to move their practice forward and start working in. Uh, amazing ways and Mm -hmm. irrespective of the pandemic the the kind of working from home virtual digital tools was upon us anyway you know my practice was using those tools before the pandemic and then when the pandemic happened and everyone was locked at home and such there was no difference for our practice it was just uh business as usual so you know the pandemic was a bit of a mini boom for us it was amazing well it's it's interesting I, I often speak to you know practices of all different sizes and it can be quite surprising how many times when a pra- when somebody leaves their practice another a larger practice to set up on their own yeah it's not uncommon for all learning about technology to cease and yeah. they will end up just kind of it's like almost like a freeze in time and you know we've spoken to practices before that have got CAD bits of CAD software yeah. and they're not utilizing the three D BIM capabilities. What, what, what of is it. CAD? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, and 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 it's and it's it's amazing. It's like right, okay, uh, you know, we live in a culture now where you can get more done with two to three people than ever before was possible. <sighs> Absolutely, and, it, and it's insane. And you know, th- this this opens up a whole new. Um, realm of possibility for practices but it's not clear it's not clear what you know what should we what should we be using and then when we enter into the world of project management software and you know you can you can get something like your Ajira's these big epic bits oh, of software which amazing, are amazing amazing but you need an phenomenal. army of people well, exactly and they become you know and it becomes quite overwhelming all these other pieces which need to be highly customized for the architect and you know there's a, there's yeah, a whole yeah. learning that's in them. yeah yeah completely so, completely yeah. agree so, so, so your your experience. What have you What have you been seeing? Some of the kind of issues that many um, SMEs are facing in their, you know, some of the mistakes perhaps that they make or pitfalls, perhaps is better. Well, to describe. The, the main thing is, I think I would really 
concur with what you're saying is that people jump in. Um, I, I love, I love that. Um, you know, that book, the e-myth. Yes. That every, every, every business owner needs to read. And, and I love that line where it says, um, you know, you leave your boss, your idiot boss behind and you, you, your new boss is a lunatic, which is obviously a raving tyrant. Yes. <laughs> which is yourself. And so then you get a, a real appreciation of what your previous idiot boss used to do and the things they have to deal with. And you're quite right is that because your time then goes down, you think you're going to have more time, but you actually have less time because you're dealing with so much stuff, you're spread thin, that you yeah. don't have the time to investigate things that uh, previously you had. And maybe you don't have the interest because everyone's interests are varied. Every, everyone, every person's skills are varied as well. So I, I was always very interested in systems and you know, doing things easy and, and not having to do things twice. That really annoys me. And yeah. it's just boring. You know, we want to do yeah. cool stuff. We want to do innovation. We, we want to do architecting, which, you know, most architect would be agree is the designy stuff. Yeah. But, um, when, when I was at college, there was a, there was a tutor called Seamus and he, he said, he was an Irish guy. He said, he said, Gordon, Gordon, I know you want to do the design stuff, but don't forget about all the other bits because that will be your degree mark. I was like, oh, that's good advice. So I did all, all the other bits, even though, our, you know, sound calculations or whatever we were doing. Yeah. Maybe not not the most interesting, but I was thinking, oh, don't, actually do this and, and get a decent mark because then mm -hmm. they all add up and then boom, you're in the top five of your year kind of thing because yeah. no, no one did the sound calculations. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, people, uh, architects just need to get more into the digital technologies, or I call it the digital stack. What mm -hmm. are the tools that your practice needs? And it might be slightly different for every practice. And so um, over the years, uh, since probably about eight years ago, I, I really embarked on this. Like when I started the practice, I know I wanted to use BIM. I wanted um, uh, a software to run the practice and, and leverage tools. So I was always in that mindset. And that's that was the key thing, the mindset. And then everything has just kind of grown out of that. And every decision, every tool that has come along, it either saves you time and make, makes things easier and better, mm -hmm. or it doesn't. Yep. If, it, if it's easier and better, then you keep it. If it doesn't, you, you discard and you look for something else if available. Yeah. So that's all we do. It's, it's, it's really, really. In, and, and so I've developed a sort of a, a digital sort of stack that uh, allows what you said before, a, a team of three, or I always say uh, a, a group of five architects can literally take over the world. Yep. They can probably compete with any practice on the planet with the right tools. So what what's the kind of main suite then? What 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 sorts of activities are incorporated in in Youp? How would you describe it? So um, our, our, I mean, irrespective of Youp knows because that's just one of the tools. Um, right. I would say that our digital suite. I've actually I've written them down because I knew you were going to ask me. <laughs> so um, the first thing um, I did when. Uh, little bit of a story. I started my practice with a with a business partner from college. I, I'm just the, such the stereotype. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were great mates and all that kind of stuff. And we got to a point where we didn't really make much money. We did some great schemes, all of those kind of things when you're a young architect starting your own practice. And we didn't really know much about stuff. He eventually got kind of fed up with just... I don't know, life, whatever. So he decided to leave. It's at that point was my um, rebirth where I was in charge of everything. So therefore I can do what I want. Renaissance. <laughs> I, I'm in charge. Um, so I kind of just did what I wanted to and I just did it instantly. And I instantly just started implementing systems uh, setting um, targets, getting a growth mindset. I, got, I went out and got myself a, a business coach. I mm -hmm. just went, bam, you know, uh, this is how uh, a business should be run. And this particular business happens to do architecture. 
And that, I think that's a really important point. Rather than where architects trying to do business, you flip it around. So yeah. that's, that's, that was my kind of goal. And, um, I was super scared and I, because I was all by myself and I had staff and, you know, you have PAYE and all these responsibilities. So I, I just, I just went for it and it was just sort of pure nerve really. And so the first tool I got, I noticed that I had a room full of people working and every time the phone went, one of them would have to answer the phone and they're all working. They're all trying to do stuff and they're all interrupted. And half of them are useless at answering the phone and passing on messages and all that because they don't want to do it. Yep. And then, so it's just a very awkward kind of thing. It's very ad hoc. So what I did, I got a call service. So all of a sudden, um, when you call, you, it's still the same service. When you call you Architects, you get a call service. I don't know where they are, but um, they're super good. They answer it, UP Architects, blah, blah, blah. They take... You know, all of the details with the pre uh, arranged questions, take the, the call back. So if, if, if it then gets put through to my mobile phone or a staff's mobile phone, if I'm busy, say I'm, I'm recording this podcast with you, if I don't pick up that call, I can just look at my email because there'll be a little summary of what the call was. If it's a new inquiry, am I going to ring them back? Yes, I am. If it's something else, oh, I can call them tomorrow, you know. All of yeah. a sudden, I, I can triage the income. And I never, I always tell people, I never miss a lead again. How good mm-hmm. is that? You yeah. Know? The, ha, it took a lot of effort for someone to call your practice because they've got a job. You don't want to lose that. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people pay a lot of advertising to get that um, that lead, and I never miss them. And then yeah. if I call them, I can, I can even if it's late, whatever, I text them. The power of a text is amazing. I'll say, uh, sorry to miss your call. Can I call you tomorrow? And it'll be Gordon, the architect from you, you architects. Yeah. I always use the word architect twice, reinforce it. Uh, <laughs> gives me credibility. Um, and you know, you just don't want to lose those things. So call service all of a sudden just, uh, you know, unburden my staff from, and they were pretty useless at it, to be honest. Um, the next thing I got was a proposal software. So, uh, I, I used, I looked at a lot of proposal software. YouTube's a, an amazing tool to, because there's always someone who will say, these are the six top proposal softwares, you know, check and, and they go through and say, what are the pros and cons? And then you can decide for you what your business you're into, which will work for you. Mm-hmm. And I chose proposify.com. And I think that that's really jumped up my conversion rate and, I can literally do a proposal in three minutes. It's, it's that easy. And when, when, when it's about time, freeing up your time, if, if I get a lead come in, I have a chat on the phone or, or, or whatever, I can then say, uh, do you, do you want me to send you a fee proposal, et cetera? It's got a lot of information on there. It's really useful. They all say yes. Mm-hmm. Email address. You ha- you've got all that. I even have a form that I write out and then I convert that into my, Fee proposal takes three minutes and it, it does templated emails, all of those things, it even does an auto follow up two days later or how many days later. And your conversion rate just goes like that. And you can, when, when they sign on the line, they digitally sign it and then they right. get another email saying welcome. And, uh, and then it has my important one, two, three that it's not my fault. So, so propo- proposal fires is a kind of, um, bit of software a bit like um DocuSign where you're able to digitally yep. sign stuff there's and then there's you've got a a template or boilerplate proposal in there and then you can just adjust it yeah but it's like DocuSign on speed or something because you can put video in there it has little mini you can put the numbers in right you okay. can put the tax in everything it's amazing you can put the t's and c's and and then they digitally sign it and you get an email, pops up on my Apple Watch, you've sealed it. You know, if you're drinking wine at, at, at 8 p.m. on Friday night and it goes ping, uh, congratulations, blah, blah, just sealed the deal, another eight grand job. That's cool. It just Happy makes you feel so good. Yeah. So good. And it, and it has all your stats and your metrics, mm-hmm. which is amazing. Um, Next thing I got was um, we always ran the practice on Mac servers, which I looked after because uh, 
they're pretty easy to look after. But then I, I was paying like 200 pounds a month on backups to the cloud. How crazy is that? Wow. And, yeah. uh, and that was, that was many years ago. That was for like, you know, X gigabytes. And so again, did research and I said, oh, we can, it's not like oh, I went out and found these things. I think technology started, you know, it became available. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden internet was faster. We had the best internet connection, the best upload speed. Yeah. And we well, found. Well, as you, as you say, technology now in terms of, you know, small, not just architecture practices, but, you know, the kind of technology that's been made available for um, small tech companies or for, you know, for anything really is, it's just <sighs> mind bending. It's just so good. So good. And people have sorted it for you. Mm-hmm. So the next one was ignite.com. So right. ignite like as ignite a fire, but not an I, it's a Y. And you can just throw everything on you and you can just, it, it's like you've got a server in your office, but it's in a cloud and it, you send people's links. I've never sent a PDF in an email for forever. It's always a link. Mm-hmm. So you don't clog up your, your Gmail or, or, or whatever oh. with all your attachments. You know, oh, the attachment's too big. Um, it's just links. It's amazing. And um, our links don't expire. You know, you get those other services where the links expire that drive you crackers. Yep. Ours are set, don't expire. And unlimited versioning of files. You can open a BIM file from from the web, which is incredible because mm-hmm. they're like 200 meg plus. Yep. Can't open the same file at the same time. You know, it just takes care of it. They've sorted it out. I don't need to think about it, you know. There's clever people out there. And um, and and now I don't have to do backups. So by subscribing to Ignite.com, I actually saved myself a lot of money wow. by just not doing the backups. So it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, what was the next thing? The next thing we got was um, – internal communication because we were starting to kind of like work from home, all of those kind of things. And I I knew I wanted to go virtual. So I I knew I didn't want to use email, you know, because email is probably the best tool of the 21st century, but also the worst. It's, Mm -hmm. I don't think we've, we still haven't figured it out really. Um, I mean, we're kind, of, I, we're, kind of, we're kind of stuck with it. It's like yeah. it's a, it's a bit of an old dating technology that just because it's so commonplace, we've kind of we're kind of stuck with it for now. Can, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah. Did you ever write a letter as an architect? I, <laughs> there, there'll, there'll be if if architects, you'll be able to see no. what the age groups are. I know, don't think I've ever written. Put a your letter. hand up if you wrote a letter as an architect. And then the no. next one is. Um, did you ever send a fax as an architect? Yes, I've sent a fax. There you this go. Is, this, you kind of this, got in the fax. This is like this is like two thousand and three yeah. or something like that. I've sent faxes. Yeah, that was my part one job. That was my first yeah. job as an architect. We were sending yeah. faxes. So if if you send a letter with some drawings, it's got, it takes a day to send. They're going to look mm-hmm. at it for a day, and if they want to reply, so there's a cycle of like minimum, well, max minimum, minimum three days. And then the facts came along and sort of it turned it sort of 24 hours. And now we've got the email, which is like instantaneous. And he's just like, oh, no, there's nowhere to hide. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, quite interesting technology. But um, we, we need to kind of figure out uh, what is a better internal communication than email. Mm-hmm. And we we chose Slack. Yeah. That was the, the hot thing and we quite liked it because it wasn't one of the big players mm-hmm. it was independent and it was cool and and we still use it and uh yeah we really like it um it you, you can also do the same uh with microsoft teams i yep. think google chat is just being integrated into gmail mm-hmm. uh i think that happened almost like yesterday um, they made that compulsory. Well, I, I'm, I'm, we use Slack a lot here at BOA. We use it. I've used it in my architecture company. Cool. I, I, any kind of venture I get involved with anybody, we jump onto Slack. Yeah. And it becomes something not just for its power for, you know, internal comms, but it's actually a place where we'll find that we open channels up 
And for example, if you're creating video standard operating procedures, for example, if you're using something like Loom and you're recording yourself doing something, then you just open up a channel and then you start dumping everything into there. And it's very search function is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The search function is, is, is fantastic and everything is is there it's a place that documents end up getting they don't not not permanent homes but it's often the first place to look for something is on yeah, is on yeah we've got a practice channel so every time we we learn there's an update or a, there's a link i know harrow council have just they, they've got now a gis map mm-hmm. thing of their borough so you can then find all the listed buildings all the locally listed the conservation areas their particular flood risk, which is different from environmental agency, you Mm -hmm. can pop it all up or you can see a site and then it's amazing. Such a great tool. Uh, Well done, Harrow Council. But And a number of councils have have done that now, but it saves us architects a huge amount of time just Mm -hmm. trying to figure out if if something was in a conservation area was was hard work in in the past. I I remember I remember this having to work out if if a particular you know site you were looking at was in a conservation area if the client didn't know themselves yeah it, and they, the mucking around on looking yeah. at maps and yes. downloading the maps and then kind of just trying to overlay and figure yeah, out yeah you have to get Google Map and then you <laughs> have to get their map and they never quite look the same and I I always think that what they, I can't believe I cannot just Google or type in the postcode yeah. and it just tells you immediately ah, yes cool. or no. Exactly. Well, you can now. Amazing. Okay, Amazing. I'm liking. All well, it's of even better. It's on a GIS system that. Right. And you can you can just you, it's got all these buttons and you can choose which buttons you want to look at, which is like mm-hmm. flood risk and all of those cool things. So you know, uh, very good for us architects. And also, you know, the Google 3D and and the Apple 3D is amazing for us. It, sometimes it's easier to see it online than it is if you go and look at the actual site. Yeah, because you can fly around in a kind of aerial fly view. Fly around, see the context. You can run up and down the road to see, you know, what's the flavor of the street. Uh, it's hard to do that on site. So it's amazing. So we did that. Obviously, we already had uh, BIM up and running since, uh, yeah. I think, 2010, 2010. Early adopter there. Um, we, we use uh, Archicad. The reason I chose Archicad, you know, because – I've used AutoCAD. I've got a city and guilds in AutoCAD in uh, the DOS <laughs> version, if you can believe that. And then uh, I actually joined a practice and set up their first computer and then their first network all on Autodesk products. And then the the practice actually got two incredibly experienced architects. It was a bit of a a coup and one of them was like um, a micro station i'm going to call them a ninja a micro station ninja they really knew how to use it but also how to set it up and how to use it in a practice rather than just clicking buttons and i think there's a real difference there a real system wise approach and i really loved her so we actually changed the practice from uh autodesk products to bentley which is micro station and um, at the time, all the cool practices, or well, got to be careful here, all the design practices in the UK, or let's say London, were using MicroStation. Yeah. Somehow there was that kind of divide. And so I was quite happy to go to MicroStation. And, mm-hmm. and I really, really liked it. It, it, it was, it, it, I think Autodesk comes from more of an engineering and you can get stuff happen really quick. But the microstation was more considered about how to craft um, information and have multiple people working on one building. Mm-hmm. That was really, really good. So I like that. So, um, but then um, when I saw my practice, we went to Archicad simply because it was cross platform. So we could have people on PCs and people on Macs. And I thought yes. that's really, really nice. That was interesting. I remember microstation used to be um back in like early 2000s was available on max and yes. had a good had a good solid platform there and then it changed and then you had this exactly what you're saying lots of the yeah. design practices I remember when i was at rogers that was a microstation practice yeah and some of these practices as well have had extraordinary training and then you set up your own practice and you're like, uh, uh I, I don't want to use PCs. I want to use Macs or yeah. 
Am I going to split the hard drive and do that weird thing where you have yeah. Windows on a Mac and it's all a bit... Very awkward, very awkward. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I thought I'd just get rid of that. And um, and and I, I then just sought out people who used ArchiCAD. And yeah. people who tended to use ArchiCAD were a bit like the MicroStation users. They're in the minority. So then they're using it because they want to use it and uh they're fans and mm -hmm. and that's great for me so i i just got the right people there so that was really cool and and i would if 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 you're a, an architectural practice that's not using bim because I, I i speak to a lot of architects now and practices when we're when we're uh, looking to do subscriptions for you knows and i i love learning about their practices and what they're using and i i kind of ask what kind of stuff they're using because that really gives me a window into where their practice is at. Yeah. And people say, uh, oh, yeah, we're not using BIM yet because we haven't got any jobs big enough. You know, we use BIM on every job. You probably – a BIM software is more efficient on small jobs mm -hmm. than big ones because a small job, you've got to turn around so quickly. You've got to, do, you've got to be hyper-efficient. Mm -hmm. And BIM, once you've set it up in there, you can change that. Mm -hmm. so fast well, so it's 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 amazing with bim i was doing a, a some small projects a while back a few years ago and we hadn't hadn't started using bim at all and i was starting to outsource a lot of work to uh to freelancers and they were like why the hell are you drawing like this in in vector works mm. and uh, and they were like, basically, you're drawing the, the way that people used to draw back in 2008. And yes. What, and I was like, oh, that's what I mean. That your kind of knowledge sometimes can freeze. Yeah. And it was through the it was through a, a group of outsourcers that we started doing everything on BIM. And I was just, it was just, yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah. It was one small little model. It yeah. reduced the delivery di time down to just a few oh, hours, rather cool. than drafting everything 2d and then making a sketch up model and it was just utter stupidity yeah yeah it's it, if you think what architects core skill is is we take the 3d world which is what mm -hmm. we exist and everyone exists in we convert it to 2d which is like drafting or something and sections indeed that's 2d yeah and then from that someone converts it back into 3d so it, it's better to sort of 3d world 3d mm -hmm. model 3d you know project so that you're yep. and then you can spin it around and you can sort of you get that next level of design get rid of the problems before they're problem incredible yep. it's yep. amazing it's amazing um no I'm, I'm glad you had uh, good good success with bim um well, it's, uh, on on that i mean i i think it's you know if people are listening to this and you know, they haven't got BIM set up in their practices and the likelihood is that they're probably using a bit of software that does have that capacity Yeah. anyway. Mm. Like, you know, investing in training or a training program of somebody just for a few hours just to make sure that you're maximizing, yeah. you know, everything you can get out of your program is, is, a, is, a, is a good investment. There'll be someone in your practice that wants to do it. Yeah. And I always call them um, the champion. Mm-hmm. All you need is one champion in the practice because as soon as you can see what it does and um, the results, et cetera, you'll want to try and push every project through the BIM and that person. And then the other people will get infected with, wow, this is exciting. Actually, I, I, this skill I need. So yeah. uh, it's it's good. And then if you've got Older people who are like, you know, they, they learned CAD when they were younger, et cetera, and it's harder for them to to leave their really good skills behind. Then if you've got other people who are the champions in the in the practice, then it's much easier to sort of that that learning uh, happens much easier. Mm. So uh, I always suggest that. Um, cloud uh, accounting. Most people have got a cloud accounting these days. But um, the reason I mentioned that, we use uh, Zero, but uh, I think most of the accounting softwares are in the cloud now. Yeah. The reason I mentioned that is that Proposify, when we send a proposal, when they accept it online, there's there's a, a native integration into Zero, So I can just hit a button and it throws like uh, an invoice straight into Zero accounting software. So boom, 
you're ready to go. It's it's all about saving time. Mm-hmm. If 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 you can do something way quicker and more efficient and on the ball, then people think you're efficient and on the ball because you are. And then you've got if you just do it then and there, boom, then you don't have to manage it. That's, a, that's yeah. A, um, other things are CRMs, but mm-hmm. CRMs is like a sort of a double-edged sword. Um, they do need a little bit of time to, to figure out what they are, what you're going to use them for. But what I would suggest, the the easiest, the, the best function I found on a CRM was not for a database or, or whatever. It, it, it kind of is, but sending uh, emails in bulk. So instead of doing um, like MailChimp, which is like a newsletter, there, there's a, another concept in CRMs. Not all the CRMs have it, but it might be called um, scale mail or various other things. And what it what the difference is, you can only send a certain number of emails via this method and it comes from you. So it doesn't come from MailChimp server and then mm-hmm. – because what I've noticed uh, over the years is when we started in 2008, the, f- the first thing I bought was a, um, uh, a, a mail program thing. And we used to send out an email um, thing like MailChimp. And we used to get open rates of like above 70%, which is just amazing. We did yeah. so much business from that. But then over the years, you just saw it dwindle, dwindle, dwindle because – All the Gmails and such, they filter it all out. It goes into another kind of column somewhere that you don't open. So I'd be kind of careful with those uh, MailChimps and those kinds of things because I think they're less effective now. Whereas if you send someone an email, they're quite likely to open it. Mm -hmm. People can't help themselves. But um, so (laughs) it needs to come from you. It can't come from a service. Yes. a lot of these CRMs have the ability to send. So what, what we do is we have lists, very defined lists. They might be a, uh, real estate agents because, you know, they're a referrer of business. Builders, they're potentially referrers of business. Um, customers, because they're customers, mm-hmm. they also know other customers and get repeat business. So you make very discrete lists, which are then much smaller then you can write um, a series of emails over time and send it to that list and it, and it feels very personal and bespoke rather than yes. generic. And people do open those and, and, and people do reply as if I wrote them to. <laughs> so yeah. it, I think email is still an incredibly powerful tool and uh, leveraging the customers you've got already and just asking for another job is is amazingly powerful. Well this this is a this again this is brilliant. You know CRMs often will be a mysterious thing to many architects but they are like the staple tool for any serious marketer. Yeah. And again the what's available is extraordinary. I mean we yeah. use a BOA we use Keep or Infusionsoft as it was formerly known which again yeah. is one of these epic bits of software. Yeah. Um, it's got it's very, so many it, buttons. It, it, it can do anything. It is quite complicated to use, yeah. but there are all sorts of other things like Active Campaign. I found that's quite, yeah, um, that's quite a good one. Yeah. Um, what ones we, do you, have you? We you we, we use well. Um, the 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 thing is, I I used uh one for just like so long. Um, it was called Contactually. Right. And it had this scale mail, had it all set up. I had all my templated emails, you know, used to send stuff out Christmas. You know, I could send, I think I could send 300 emails, 300, yeah, 300 emails a a day. So if I had a group that was bigger than that, say it was a Christmas thing, so it's a bit more generic. Yeah. You could just do, boom, you could do it over a series of days. And, and, and that was super good. And that, and that is, that gets good results because it comes from you. But they, they pivoted into, uh, more of a sort of a vertical niche such that they got bought by someone and kind of closed down, but absorbed. So, uh, I'm using close.com now, which. Ah, yep. I know close, close.io. Is it yep. close.io? And it's got close.io, like a- quite right. Yeah. 
and it's got a nice kind of Kanban yep. way of reviewing stuff. Yeah. It's quite a year and it's got like a, cause we use Max. It, I'm the only one who really uses it in the practice. Um, yep. Cause I do that kind of sales and marketing thing, but um, it's even got a native app for your Mac, but it's on the web as well. So if it's web, it's Mac PC, it's no problem. But again, like you were saying, very sophisticated. And I, I think I'm using 2%. <laughs> yeah. So th- this is why I put the CRM at the, at the bottom, because it really is a, a learning curve and um, y- y- you might decide to I- – I would watch some YouTube videos to figure out what a CRM can do for your practice or what you want it to do and then maybe reach out to someone on Upwork or uh, People Per Hour or maybe a local other business community person or something in your in your network to sort yeah. of set it up with you. Um I would then sort of say the next kind of big area is website, social media, and Google business. Website's really important. Um, when, when, when I had that kind of change, when my, my partner left, um, I was, I, I was the guy who was, did the, the website and the branding, you know, I, I was, I came up with the name Youp and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always marketing kind of focused because if you can't get any jobs, you can't be like a good architect. <laughs> you yeah. can't be the best architect if you don't get any jobs. So um, the website, we, the first website we ever set up, which was like 2008, was just text. Mm-hmm. And it actually was really effective. Um, obviously, the internet has moved on. And I always think the internet is you, your website, you should always uh, think in dog years. <laughs> so, so if your website's like uh, a year old, it's really seven because <laughs> that's dog years, isn't it? Seven, seven to one. I can't remember. But a- anyway, if you've had a, if you've got a website that's three or four years old, that that's quite old. Yeah. And, and especially if you haven't done anything to it or developed or, or say it's not a live thing. So if it hasn't got a blog or an Insta on there or something to keep it constantly fresh, and, and I'm not talking about your customers coming because they're only going to come for a certain point. It's Google and all of these other services that are looking at your website and saying, is this architect an expert in their area? And that's where they kind of like then put you in the rankings and such. Yeah. So, you know, it's really, really well, it's, important. It's, it's interesting. How would you, uh, you know, where would you rate the importance of actually having a website nowadays particularly if say you, you you know we see marketers all the time who are very skilled with crms building email lists facebook advertising and you can build a business without a website absolutely but uh, th- this is where we're going to delve into um probably your area of uh coaching and business is every architectural practice needs to define their niche and they yep. need to probably have two at least two niches with a backup niche i would say and if if your if your niche is business to business so you're an architect selling to um i don't know independent supermarket type things so you're doing big sheds or something Mm -hmm. um real sexy stuff can be um or you know do are you going to get work from a website Probably not. You know, the CEO yeah. of whatever, you know, independent supermarket or warehouse is not going to go onto your website now. So I'll have some of that. So <laughs> maybe websites and Facebook and such is more business to consumer, B2C. Yeah. And, but so my top tip that we found early on is I had great success with website. And then as we grew as a practice and we did all sorts of projects like you do, Anything that came along, we ate. We just did it. And then you get to a point and you go, oh, who are we? What, what, what do we stand for? What do we want to do? And that's when your website gets very confusing to the outside world because a person lands on your website and goes, oh, they're architects. And um, us architects just immediately assume that everyone knows what an architect does. And then what we do is we show uh, all our projects and it, it kind of means nothing to prospective clients. And yeah. 
One of one of my Insta reels, you know, people always laugh at my Insta reels. I have fun doing them, and, and one of them is um, architects. Is your website a love letter to other architects? <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many. You go onto the to the architect's website, and it's really just showing off to other architects. Yeah, and it doesn't communicate to. They go, oh gosh, I would like them to design me something such, but I think they're too expensive, because the architect's showing all their poshest, amazing jobs and it scares everyone away potentially yeah so what we did was came up with a, a cunning plan where we said okay we're going to have website for niche one website for niche two and then if we do a third niche we will do a website for that and what we because then if you do a marketing campaign which is if you did facebook ads or google ads or uh, a mail drop or an email kind of delivery thing. It wants to come back to what you said. We are the best architects that deliver dental practices. That's really, really clear. If you that's on your website and then you show five dental practices that you've done. Mm -hmm. Versus if a dentist then goes to another gen generalist practice and goes, well, they've done a dental practice, but they're doing barn conversions and blah, 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 blah. Got a church I'm going to the experts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it might be the same practice. You know, um, this is how you dominate your area. This is how you you get um competitive advantage over your area about mm -hmm. what you do because you do, become do you, do you think there is any value in marketing to other architects? No. <laughs> None whatsoever. Um, I suppose if you want to get staff, but again, it comes down to niche. And I would say, how do, how do people get staff? Uh, probably word of mouth or through the existing staff. Mm -hmm. I think that's because I've always got a job typically because you, you know someone and you want to work for that practice because you know what they do. Yep. And I, I think you can kind of see uh, an architect's practice footprint in social media. You can kind of see a bit more than mm -hmm. what a consumer might or a, a person who wants to consume their goods and services. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the really the main reason why we'd want to be making our uh, websites appeal, appealing to other architects is yeah. because it's going to be building up, you know, for uh, your network for hiring or it's, yeah. you know, it becomes appealing for other architects. Yeah. Maybe in terms of, um, you know, industry standing and things like that, but they're, they're secondary. Yeah. Your, your, your website should be primarily a tool for winning work. Absolutely. So we, 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 we develop funnels, Google ads, all of those mm -hmm. kind of things. And even those funnels didn't go to the website. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I did a lot of work and research in this because originally we were doing ads and pushing them to the website and then they get lost in the website and then the phone rings and they navigate away or something else and you've lost them and you've paid X money to, to get them there. So we have a funnel and you click on that and you go to a, like a micro landing page and it, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, the funnel will be like, do, do, do you need an orange thing designing? I, I need an orange thing. So you click on it and it takes you to a micro thing. Get your orange thing designed. Click this <laughs> button here and make that booking. So it's it's a bit marketing, whatever, but it, it stops people kind of getting distracted. It's yeah. Like, oh, here's yeah. a shiny thing. Oh, go look at that. Oh, a barn conversion. Oh, this. And then they, they don't do the call to action and you lose yep. them. And you lost your money. And then there'll be someone on the next podcast saying, I've done Google adverts and they don't work <laughs> because they didn't set it up right and they didn't yep. get the right people involved. So I would say Facebook adverts don't work. They well, don't it's, work. it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this whole idea will often, you know, when I say to people, well, you know, you don't, you know, wow. before you, before you spend 60, 60,000, 10,000, whatever it is, what big investment you're about to make on your, in your websites, you yeah. know that you can build funnels. Yeah. Way cheaper. Way cheaper. Right? And, and, and test and measure. 
and, 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 and so yeah, exactly. Fun. And you've you've got the ability to be able to measure every little last yeah. metric inside oh, of it, so that you can so refine it and make it better. And yeah. it doesn't ever touch a website. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be sort of hyper niche, like what you're talking about. Yes. You, know, you, you can build one funnel for one niche, another yeah. funnel for another niche, et cetera, et cetera. I, I love that word hyper niche because I think this is where architects, because, you know, we were talking about the practice of three, practice of five. We've got subscribers that, you know, 10 in a, in a practice, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have a whole bunch of niches. You can have a whole bunch of departments. You know, you can... You, you can set up, you, you might be the same practice, but you, how you project to the outside world can be completely different because yep. the digital world, you know, no, we, we've got a, we had, we don't have an office anymore. We mm-hmm. went virtual and we've still, I've got a, a London phone number and a London address and I've got St. Albans phone number. You can just get as many phone numbers as you want um, and, and, and addresses and such. So you can set yourself up think we were in a local area so we're very strong in that and we continue to be but yeah you can push out it's really really interesting and project yeah. yourself as being uh, very niche and that's what i think even high street shops if you're not niche and experiential then you probably out of business soon yeah well this is this is what becomes interesting is and from a marketing standpoint is to recognize yes being hyper niche this is how you're going to communicate to your target audience mm. if you're worried about you know because sometimes it will get collapsed so mm. architects will worry about what well, but we, you know there's a lot of value in being generalists to yeah. an architect there is and yeah. behind the scenes there is absolutely yeah. but it's not we don't want to communicate that to because a, a client just doesn't care or understand that your insights from designing a rear extension on a suburban house is going to impact how their hospital is laid out. They don't care. It's not exactly. It's, exactly. it's not relevant. It's too much yeah. of a difficult argument to to make, even so though we, there we, might be real wisdom in there. You know exactly. We we were doing like big posh houses in Canada. I, I think I explained this to you last We we we've done so many houses in Canada, um, uh, Miami, Bahamas, Harbor Island, all of those kind of cool places. Mm-hmm. And then we had um, a- another website that was very domestic. So one day I was working on like this with turrets. And then the next day I'm, I'm doing some sort of like, you know, uh, kitchen, living, dining room with an island, um, which I really like. The reason I do those projects is because I still talk to a lot of architectural practice and go, oh, we're only five. And I'm like, five? You can take over the planet. Come on. Don't worry <laughs> about, you know. D- d- stop being hard on yourself. And uh, and this is, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing these kind of like um, homeowner projects, but we're, we want to transit. Architects still feel that somehow doing a homeowner project is something dirty or something. Or it's, mm-hmm. not, it's beneath them. And I think this is where the architectural technologists are really muscling them off the ball. Yep. Because they're doing an amazing job. A lot of our customers are the architectural technologists. Mm-hmm. They're doing you, such know, work. you know what? I interview a lot of architectural technologists on the on the show. They're often running the most um, profitable businesses. Yeah, they're cleaning up. They're often taking advantage of lots of digital marketing. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Aura, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> there's a few. There's 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 really they're, 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 they're trialing new nose at the moment. And 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 it's and it's fantastic. And yes, you know, it's it's interesting. I do understand that they're. There's a, you know, you know, I've, I've interviewed people in the podcast before who have gone into the architecture business yeah. because they thought that there was a gap in the market and mm. they saw architecture as a business first. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and when and when that's happened, then there's there's a lot more, you know, you've got a lot more space and freedom to play. Yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. So, and and th- this is where it comes back to your practice when you start your practice or you. You, you, you're starting to keep the lights on, you pay the bills. You've got to think, what are my niches? What do I want to do in life in terms of business and architecture? And uh, I feel a lot of practices don't have that conversation within the, with the, the directors or the, if, if you're, uh, if it's just you as the boss, you don't have that conversation with yourself. And I think then what they do is they kind of sleepwalk through 10 years and get a bit disillusioned. And they get stressed because they're doing everything because no one can do it like them and all that kind of stuff. 
So, um, and that's where the tools come in. You know, if you employ these tools, you'll, you will empower your team. You will, you will supercharge them. But what I'll do is I'll pivot swiftly onto you knows, which is I talked all of these kind of tools that, um, I, that, 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 that we've got and we put into the heart of you architects. Mm -hmm. But the tool that was missing was how to track all the projects. Uh -huh. Who's the client? When's a planning determination due? Just what's going on in each project and all the projects. So, you know, I can tell you that UP Architects has 68 live projects at the moment. And in UP, in UP knows it has a dashboard and it tells you all those things. The number of, uh, well, no one can ever tell me when I, when they, that we do a demo and, and I show them UP knows. No one can ever tell me how many projects they've actually got, which is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. They just don't know. And, and I think that is just a, a real window into the architectural service. So it was the missing piece of the pie where we just wanted to get our practice moving. We had all these other tools and we have since kind of like formulated it into a kind of a concept of speed, profit and momentum. So I think an architectural, a successful architectural business needs to have speed in what it delivers. Whether and and you should think of those things as products mm -hmm. and standardize them. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of architects, you know, the real highfalutin, super designy ones going, oh, spitting at the screen or something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but what you if, if imagine you walk into a restaurant and it's got a hundred things on a rest on the menu and it's all super cheap. Do you think that's a good restaurant? Probably not necessarily. Not. No. If you went into a Michelin star restaurant, you may not even get to choose anything from the menu. It might be a tasting menu of five, seven, or nine courses. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So a good restaurant has like six things on the menu because how can you do a hundred things? How can you yep. be set up to do a hundred things at high quality? So I would say to the, to the architects who are really, really saying, well, it's all about design and it's, it's, there's a mystique about it. I said, well, you, you've got to be really focused about what you do and you want to standardize all the things that you can standardize. And then you will have more time and energy to create the magic of what your practice does. So speed and delivery, I think, is really, really important. And what we do is the, the reason that's important is you, you want to break it down into standardized chunks so that the people in your team, they know what the hell they're doing. You know, yeah. it's boom, boom, boom. And even the client knows when you've done that bit, done that bit. Mm -hmm. Whereas architecture back in the day when we used to do it was just a big blamange. Mm -hmm. No, the client didn't know what the hell we were doing. Yep. The staff didn't really know what we were doing. They, you were just telling them what to do, blow by blow, and and just trying to keep it all going. And it was all a bit of a mess. And then that really affects your cash flow because you you're not at recognised billing points. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we thought we've got to be able to deliver things fast, and then profit. If you're not charging the right amount of money and often enough, that's when you, you go out of business because it, you know, you, you just, you haven't got a business. So the faster you can do stuff, you can get to, to billing points faster. Your cash flow will start taking care of itself. And the third thing, momentum. So then that all kind of encompasses all the. What are we doing around the practice to kind of keep it all going? So that sort of social media, all of those kind of things, all of the efforts where you go networking and such, is it pushing your practice forward all the time so that the jobs coming in become easier and easier? So I think we got to a point where actually people are calling me. I've got my funnels. I've got this. I've got that. And then I've gotten referrals from previous customers. And then, you know, you just, you just get in this kind of like barrage of jobs all the time. Yeah. So getting jobs and, and all you need to do is just keep the momentum going. 
So my business coach says, oh, uh, a business sometimes is like a really big stone ball. Mm -hmm. He says, you've got to push the stone ball and move the stone ball. But at the beginning, it's really, really hard. And you've got to put all your effort into moving that ball. But once you start to get it to roll, all you need to do is give it a push every now and again. And then if you can get a practice to a certain point, it's like you find a a downward slope and the ball starts just going for it, you know? (laughs) And 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 then then you're on a you're on some sort of juggernaut ride and you know that kind of thing. But coming back to it, this is where I see a lot of the subscribers to you knows coming to us is they're either in a bit of chaos and they need to sort their lives out, their their professional lives, which spills over into their personal, yep. or they they're starting to become successful, and they know that if they get some more jobs they'll be a victim of their own success. Yep. So really, really important to have a system. And that's what you, you know, does it, it, it's got a whole bunch of tools in there that's based on customizing your template, the way you, your practice works. And, uh, it has a feedback loop that, mm-hmm. that spreadsheets don't, all those kind of things. And it only has just what it needs really. So it's, a, so, so essentially it's a project management a, it like is a project, project management tool, yeah. A very focused, yeah. hyper focused SME architects in the UK. Right. Although we do have two Spanish customers, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so I'm assuming that it, it being hyper-focused on the UK, that it kind of goes through the Reba work stages or it's got lots of language that UK architects would be familiar with. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They better recognize immediately. So when we do the demo, they go, oh, yeah, this is what we do. Mm-hmm. How did you know? <laughs> and so how did you how did the how did the development of this software begin? So you know, since I we did our practice and we got uh to a point where actually life became good and comfortable and we were running a, a business. Mm-hmm. Uh and I think that's a really, really important thing to say is that most you've got to get your architectural practice so that it is a business. Yeah, because then it gives you time and resources to sort of look around. Um, otherwise, you're too busy in the business to work on the business, mm-hmm. and and this is where if you've got the time, that's where you're in uh, investing in the momentum of the business. So I was looking at the momentum in the business, and I was also this is the last thing we haven't cracked. You know, we're still getting pushed around by clients saying, when's this? And and I was still kind of getting frustrated with staff saying, when's that planning determination due? We just got a decision notice and we didn't even know. You know, we didn't follow up the, uh, the, the planners. Whether that would make a difference these days, I'm not sure. But somehow you want to feel that you're in control of the process. And mm-hmm. I think clients expect you to be in control of the process. And um, so I felt that how do you track all these things? And we tried the the spreadsheet, very complicated. Um, that didn't that was great, but it didn't work because if you don't update the spreadsheet on an hourly, daily basis, every, you don't know if any of the information's up to date. Yep. I then devised a big whiteboard with magnetic things that I could move. Again, if I wasn't in the office to move things and update, no one else could update it because it was my whiteboard and not not virtual. Um, so I was trying to take these things and then it was like, well, it, it should tell me that I haven't moved this thing for a while. So I was starting to formulate this kind of what I wanted. So I had the problem and it was a really common problem to all architects. Very, so we are all neat there. And so what I did was I found a guy who could do websites like WordPress, all that kind of stuff. And I explained, and I did lots of flow diagrams and such. And uh, he built something from those flow diagrams. And we played around with it. It kind of worked, but it was compl- it was so horrible. It was just just awful, really, really awful, because, you know, it didn't have the interface and all that so but, but it worked kind of just enough to go oh this is this is this is interesting and again because i was 
doing okay. You know, I had money and resources coming in. I was just like, let's, let's, let's push this on a bit. And yeah. so, so then I started talking to this. He was an American guy. It was, it was always good to use people from around the world. And he said, oh, you, you know, I said, well, I need this as a proper software. Who do, he goes, I don't do that. And I said, well, do you know who I do need? And he goes, oh, yeah, you need a full stack developer. I mean, it's just like, well, well, what's that? And you start going down this rabbit hole of a whole nother world. And it was really, really interesting. And I think a lot of architects would actually like that world. The tech world's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So we found a full stack developer who put it together and it worked. But again, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. It just, it just, and he said, Gordon, you need a UX UI guy. And I'm like, what's a UX UI guy? <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and, and he says, oh, that's a, a user experience, user interface designer. And I'm like, cool. Where do I get one of those? So yeah. he goes, I don't really know anyone. You, you, I go, I'll find it. I'll find it. So I found someone. Um, they advertised themselves as, uh, he was actually Ukrainian. This was, this is quite four years ago now, quite a long time ago. Um, Ukrainian guy, and he called himself a rock star of UX UI. And I thought, well, if you call yourself I'm a rock star, star. You, you've got to be good. <laughs> you've got to be good. So, you know, I said, let's see what you got, kid. And we sent him the, the screen grabs of the software as it was, and we explained blah, blah, blah. We just dumped it on him. And and we said, it's, it's for architects. It's got to be cool, all this kind of stuff. And then I think in like two or three days, he came back with like screen grabs of all the pages and all the, the flow buttony kind of things. And we were like, oh, wow. And it was just like, I, that's when I was the client to the architect. Yeah. You know, the architect creates like 3D model and, da, 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 and like interior view and you present it to the client and the client goes, oh, and I was just like that. I was just like, this is amazing. So, um, we got that and then I gave it back to full stack developer and he goes and he makes it look like that. It's, it's incredible. Incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, I think we've, we've just come up to time here. It's probably a good place to conclude the, the, the conversation. There's a whole load of other stuff I want to know about, about you. But if, if people listening to this have been really excited and inspired about what's possible for their practice through technology. How do they get in? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? How do they get involved with, with you knows? Um, so we, we have a website. It's www.youpnose.com. If you go onto that website, you can just book a demo and um, you, you, you get the pleasure of talking to me again. <laughs> Know well, I'll, I'll, I'll put the information in the uh yeah, yeah. all that in the information of the podcast and and gordon absolutely fascinating brilliant deep dive there into the technology that can help a uh, small to medium size mm. practice basically kick ass thank you gordon. for uh, inviting me on and it, absolute pleasure uh love talking to you and uh love what you're doing with the uh the business of architecture podcast thank great you very much and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.